Roman numeral two, early modern Europe in transition. So this is the second lecture um, when we're talking about what's called the early modern period in this series. Early modern period goes from 1450 to 1750. And in part one of this series, we looked at European exploration around the world, its motives and methods, and how it administered its empires and where they established their colonies. In part two of this early modern series, we're going to look at early modern Europe. And this is very much a society in transition. And one of the things we see here on this opening slide is that in period one of Europe's history, um, the post-classical period, um, there was a lot of power of the Catholic Church, right, in the feudal, period, in the feudal um, period. But now when we get into this new early modern period, we see that because of exploration, which is kind of represented here by this globe, right? Learned men, scholars, are developing new ideas um, about the world. And so we are challenging the power of the church that we see right here in this, in this monk, right? And so because Europe is getting new ideas from exploration and they're um, starting to think, wow, the world is a much bigger, different, more different place, um, Europe is getting economic changes because it is now got colonies around the world. Europe is going to experience some very rapid change at this time. So let's get into it. What we're going to start here with is uh, religious change. And so prior to, in, in period one, um, most of Europe was under one type of Christianity. It was called Roman Catholicism. But as we go into period two here, um, we have this monk who's living in the Catholic Church. His name is Martin Luther. And Martin Luther, he has got some problems with the Catholic Church. There are some concerns that he has about what is going on with the Church. And so one of those changes is the practice of indulgences. Martin Luther is looking at the Catholic Church and he realizes that he thinks that they're too focused on money and not enough on God and not enough on reading the Bible. And so um, one of the things he points out is that the Catholic Church, in order to raise money, has told people that if you give money to the Catholic Church, they will give you time out of purgatory, which is kind of this waiting room for heaven where when you die, if you're a fairly good person but not perfect, you go to purgatory to have all your sins um, taken away from you through torture or time or punishment, and once your soul has been cleansed of those sins, then you can go to heaven. But your time in purgatory could last 50 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years, who knows. And so to avoid that kind of time of suffering, people, before they would die, they would give money to the church, and the church would give them an indulgence, which is basically kind of like a receipt that says, we're going to reduce your time in purgatory so you have less suffering after you die. Um, and so this was a big money maker, as you can imagine, for the Catholic Church. But Martin Luther said there's nothing of indulgences in the Bible, and we should look to the Bible for guidance, not the Catholic Church, not the Pope. Um, and so he says that this is wrong. The next thing he challenges is he says that, look, a lot of the Catholic priests in the church are not educated. Either they cannot read, which you would want your, your priest to do if he's teaching you about the Bible, or they can't read very well. And so he says he challenges the Catholic Church that they need to educate their priestly class more because it's the Bible that should be the center of our life, not what the church says. And that's what gets to it here, right? The centrality of the Bible. Martin Luther says that every Christian, whether they be priest or layperson, that they should read the Bible for themselves and determine God's will, not have it interpreted to them by the Pope and the Catholic Church. And this really is going at the very heart of the Catholic Church's power at this time, that they say that they are the interpreters of God's will, that God talks to the Pope, lets his will be known, and from the Pope you can reach and attain and understand a God. And so if Martin Luther, what he says is true, that anybody can understand God and read the Bible for themselves and interpret for themselves, then that really threatens the power structure of the Catholic Church. And so the Catholic Church does not like this young Catholic monk telling him um, what they can and cannot do. Now this all becomes to a head when Martin Luther posts his 95 top problems that he has with the Catholic Church. Um, it's called the 95 Theses, and he posts it for the world to see, right? He wants everybody to understand that they can think for themselves, um, and they can challenge the authority of the Church. Now according to tradition, although this is probably not true, 
According to tradition, he nailed his 95 theses to a church door in Wittenberg so that everybody could see it. Um, he probably just uh, sent it out there. Um, he probably just had it copied off and, and, and off it goes, right? Um, but this very dramatic kind of story, this myth of it, really makes the, the point be known that he is throwing down the gauntlet and he is saying to the people of Europe, you have choices in your religion. And so what we have, this launches what is known as the Protestant Reformation. So followers of Luther um, are going to be protesting the Catholic Church, and hence they get their name, Protestants. Um, now Martin Luther was living what is called the Holy Roman Empire at this point, and we see a picture of it on this map. The Holy Roman Empire is a loose collection of principalities or kingdoms that is in Central Europe, what is today called Germany. Now, each of these principalities, they have their own authority, right? Even though it says it's an empire, it's not really an empire. Each one of these little principalities that I'm kind of highlighting here, um, they have their own ruler, their own king, if you will, and their own laws, and they are just kind of loosely organized under the Holy Roman Empire and the Holy Roman Emperor himself. Now, the Holy Roman Emperor, he always wants to have more power for himself, become a more centralized empire, than what the princes, the local princes, want. And so there's always this power struggle between the emperor, who wants more centralization, and the princes, who want less centralization. And so this is all important because when the princes in the Holy Roman Empire, they hear about Martin Luther saying that we can think for ourselves and we don't have to have the Pope tell us what to do anymore, they see this as a way to rise up, not just religiously and get control over their own lives, but also politically too. Because in the past, the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, this big thing right here, right, a lot of his authority has come from just south, um, from Rome, right? Um, and so um, he, the, the Vatican, where the Pope lives in Rome, he has often been supporting the emperor in return for the emperor supporting him. They have this nice kind of symbiotic relationship. Um, and so that has given the emperor a lot of ways to centralize his power. So if I'm a prince living, oh, I don't know, up here somewhere, right? Um, if I follow Luther, not only do I get to control my own faith now, because I can read the Bible for myself, but I can also tell the emperor that, look, I also don't believe in the pope. And so the pope cannot excommunicate me for flouting the authority of the emperor. And so the, the Protestant Reformation is going to allow princes to um, just say, we're not following the emperor anymore because we don't believe that God has chosen him, like the Pope said, um, and we can do what we want. And of course the Pope is going to excommunicate princes, but if you believe that you can read the Bible for yourself, then it really doesn't matter if you're excommunicated because the Pope doesn't control your access to heaven. You do, and God does through the Bible. And so the Reformation is a religious splitting of the Christian Church on people following the Pope, called Catholics, and people not following the Pope, called Protestants, but also becomes a political uh, revolution as well, as rulers throughout Europe are going to say that I don't want to do what the Pope says anymore, I'm just going to do what I want now. Because the Pope doesn't control me religiously, and he can't control me religious, he can't control me politically through the threat of excommunication. And so we see this that the Holy Roman Empire is going to be split between Protestants and Catholics. Another group out there that is going to be willing to accept Luther's message, besides local nobility, is going to be the rising merchant class. I'm having trouble hearing you. And so the rising merchant class. Um, we have talked about them in a previous lecture, I and mean, we'll talk about them more again today. As trade goes up because of exploration and colonization, merchants are going to control that trade and get more and more wealthy, and so they want more control over their lives too. Um, and so here comes Luther that says, you can control your own life. You don't have to be controlled by the church anymore. That's going to be very appealing to them. And so we see a lot of merchants become Protestants as well. Well, this all comes to a head in the Holy Roman Empire, as some princes to say, yes, we're going to become Protestants, and we're not going to do what the Pope says, and we're not going to do what his buddy the Emperor says, so we're independent. All right? And then other German princes, Holy Roman Emperor princes, will be like, no, we're going to continue to follow the Emperor and the Pope. We think that Catholicism is the way to go. And so what results in Europe is something called the Thirty Years' War, and it's mostly in the Holy Roman Empire, what is today Germany for the most part? I um, mean, during this 30 years, we're going to see 
Um, it's, it's kingdom versus kingdom, principality versus principality. Some princes are Catholic, some princes are Protestants. And it's this huge religious civil war and political civil war that wages in the whole Roman Empire. And when it's all said and done, about one out of every three people in Germany will be killed. As you can imagine, um, you know, if, as the Protestants and Catholics are all intermixed here in the Holy Roman Empire, they're going to be fighting each other for control and for religious fervor. And so eventually it destroys most of Central Europe. And now at the end, in 1648, we're going to have something called the Peace of Westphalia. Um, and at the end of that, this war is so destructive that all the rulers in this part of Europe just say, well, whatever, right? It, the, the ruler of each principality, the ruler of each little kingdom, they'll get determined for themselves and for their people in their kingdom if they want to be Protestant and Catholic so we can end this war. And so religion is causing people, we call, it's, it's also part of this national rivalry thing that we've talked about, and it's splitting people up within Europe between Protestant countries and Catholic countries. All right. Now, the Catholic Church feels very much under attack, not just um, politically in all these wars that are going on, but they also feel under attack religiously because they're losing lots of members. A lot of people are saying, I don't want to do what the Pope says. I'm going to be Protestant and read the Bible for myself and follow Luther. Um, and so the Catholic Church has to respond, right? They're going to have to figure out how to stop the spread of this Reformation. And so they have this big meeting at Trent. It's called the Council of Trent. And at that meeting, you can see all of these religious leaders. We see the priests in black and the cardinals in red and the bishop and the pope um, in white. And it's the hierarchy of the church. And like, what should we do about this reformation? And so the first thing they do is they decide we are going to stop Protestantism. And so they, cr they say we're going to go try to stop people from being um, Protestant anymore. We'll come back to that in a second. And then they also say, well, don't spread this around. But Luther probably has a point. We probably are a little bit more too focused on wealth, and we should probably reform our church. We should tone down the sale of indulgences. We should also make sure our, our priests are educated. And so, ironically enough, they do adopt, even though they're not going to admit it, some of the ideas of the Protestant Reformation and Luther. So they try to clean up their church and reform it from within. But now let's go back to that whole thing about stopping Protestantism. And so what we have here is we have kings, Catholic kings in their country, they're going to launch what's called the Inquisition. Um, and the Inquisition is a, an attempt to root out Protestants within your community and either force them to convert back to Catholicism or kill them. Um, also, other religious groups are going to be caught up in this. So the Jewish population of Europe is going to be caught in the Inquisition. Um, and they're like, the Catholics are going to say, look, um, you're just as bad as Protestants. You don't believe in the Pope, so convert or die. And so we're going to see that Jews and Protestants and even any Muslims that are left in Europe will be attacked um, and tortured to convert. Um, and if they don't convert, then they'll either be tortured until they're, uh, until they're dead. Now, we'll see, especially in Spain, right, the Spanish Inquisition is the most famous Inquisition at this time, and the Spanish Catholic king is going to launch this Inquisition to find Protest excuse me, Protestants and Jews and Muslims and root them out and kill them. And so we here we see people being tortured on the rack, and they're totally, slowly stretched to death um, until they either confess that they're not Catholic or um, they name names of people that they know that are secretly not Catholic, um, or um, they are killed. Now, a lot of Jews at this time, to escape this, will leave um, uh, Spain and move to the Ottoman Empire, which is a Muslim empire, which, as you remember from our previous lectures, um, really allows Jews and Christians to practice their faith as long as they pay the jizya and have some religious freedom. Um, and so we see religious minorities here throughout Europe are being persecuted. If you are a Jew, you're going to be persecuted. Um, if you are Protestant in a Catholic country, you're going to be persecuted. If you're a Catholic in a Protestant country, you're going to be persecuted. And so we see not a lot of toleration for rulers for minority groups here. All right. So now let's talk about some of these rulers. Um, and so we are going to have what we call the rise of absolute monarchs. Absolute monarchs, as the name applies, are kings that are trying to centralize their control. If you remember just a few slides ago, we talked about how the Holy Roman Emperor was trying to use Catholicism to control and to centralize his control over all of his principalities, and that resulted into the Thirty Years' War. But here in Spain, we're going to talk about another king. This guy is named King Philip II. You can see him pictured in the top right. And he is sick and tired of sharing power with the nobility. 
If you remember back in period one, we talked about feudalism, that in feudalism in reality, the nobility had a lot of control, a lot of power and shifting alliances, and the king had to depend on the nobility to provide him troops in time of war and taxes in the form of tribute. Um, and so he was always kind of dependent on the nobility to do what he said, and so the king didn't really have control. Well, kings are always going to want to establish even more control for themselves. They're going to always look for a way to centralize. And in period two, it turns out they start to have the means to be able to do that, to get their own power um, for themselves and lessen the power of the nobility. And so one of the ways that kings do this is King Philip II is going to directly tax the people of Spain himself. In feudal times, the king would say to the nobility, I'm going to give you this fief, this land, and in return, you're going to collect taxes from me and give it to me. Right? So that always left him dependent on nobility to collect the taxes. But now the kings realize that if I go and directly tax the people the, myself, then I can kind of cut out the middleman. I don't need the nobility anymore to collect taxes from me, which makes the nobility irrelevant, and I can have more power, and I don't have to depend on the nobility, and so I'm centralizing my power. So direct taxation is a way to centralize power. Um, a next thing, another thing is as exploration begins and we start to see colonization, that the king of Spain is going to become very wealthy personally. He gets a portion of all the gold and silver that is being taken out of the new world. And so he is going to use that money to get wealthy. And again, he doesn't need the nobility anymore to collect money. And so he's independently wealthy, which means he's powerful and he's centralizing. Now, what does he do with all of this money? Well, um, well, we'll come back to the Inquisition in a second. What he does with this money is he builds up a strong, what we call, standing army. An army that is permanent, that is under his direct personal control. And again, let's think back to the last time period. Under feudalism, the king not only had to depend on the nobility to collect taxes for him, which made him weak, but he also had to depend on the nobility to provide him troops in times of war, which made him weak and dependent on the nobility. But now with his own form, his own money coming in through direct taxation and colonization, he can build up his own permanent personal standing army that are professional soldiers that are constantly training to be the best soldiers they can be and be experts, but also to be loyal to him because he's paying their money, right? And so now we see that the king is very, very powerful. And then, of course, the Spanish king uses the Inquisition to root out his enemies. And so um, the Spanish king is not just looking for Jews and Protestants and Muslims that are defying his authority and not being Catholic, but he also can throw some nobles in there and accuse them of being secretly Jewish or Protestant or Muslim um, just to get rid of them. Um, if you are a noble that is fighting centralization and don't want King Philip to have control, well, the king can just say, oh, you know, I'm going to use my friends, the Catholic Church, and they're going to say that this noble is secretly Protestant and I can kill him. And so all of these things are helping the King Philip, King of Spain, to centralize his control and his power and become an absolute monarch, to have absolute power instead of depending on the nobility. Another example we're going to give you, we're going to give you three. The second one is King um, Louis of France. He's King Louis XIV. Um, and King Louis XIV, pictured on the right here, he also wants to become an absolute monarch. And so he uses all of the same things we've talked about before under King Philip of Spain. Um, but he's also going to use something called the divine right. It's this idea um, that he's a Catholic as well, and he's going to partner with the Catholic Church. And he's going to say to the Catholic Church, look, you guys support me, and I will fight those Protestants for you. And so the Catholic Church says, fine, we'll do it. Um, and so he says that I want you to declare to the people of France that God has chosen me to be their king, right? You scratch my back, I scratch yours. And so the Catholic Church says, absolutely, hear ye, hear ye, all people of France, God himself has chosen King Philip to be your ruler. And this is called the power of, the power of divine right, right? So now he has even more power because to defy the king is to not just defy the king and his personal standing army, but is to defy the pope and God himself um, and risk being excommunicated. And so we see that, um, that the king is using religion to, to centralize his power. Right? He also using a standing army, and of course the king of uh, France is getting money from his colonies in Southeast Asia, and he's getting money from the fur trade in North America, and he's using that to build up his own private personal army, making the nobility less important. And here we're going to introduce something new that we didn't introduce in Spain. 
is that the king of France is going to start using a bureaucracy to run his kingdom. And so in the past, again, under the feudal pyramid, the king had to issue his orders and then depend on the nobility to carry them out for him, which made him beholden to nobility and kind of weak. But now what the king is realizing, that if I create educated bureaucrats who can take down my laws and collect taxes for me because they're literate and educated, I don't need the nobility anymore. And so he starts, instead of putting nobility into governing positions in his kingdom, he starts to put commoners that have been trained in education at schools that he's paid for. Um, and so these nobility now will be very loyal to the king because he gives them their position and they'll enforce his laws, right? The nobility were never that loyal because the nobility have their own power source, their own wealth, they have their own lands, and so they can flout the king's authority anytime they want. But not these bureaucrats, because these bureaucrats come from the third estate of France. They come from the common people, and so now the common people are totally going to do what the king says, because he put them in a position of power, um, of government workers to enforce his laws. And so we see it's just one more form of centralization. All right. Next, the king of France is going to start destroying castles around France. Um, if he, he does this because the nobility now can't rebel. If they do rebel, they have no place to hide. They've lost their own personal castle. And so we see that um, castle after castle falls and is either destroyed or forbidden from being repaired. And so this is another plot as a way of the king of France centralizing, right? That you are afraid of rebelling against me and flouting my authority because you have no place. You're, no, you're, no, you have no castle to hide in. All right. So um, here is a, a one more way, and I think a final way that we're going to talk about on this slide of centralization, is that with all of this money, not only does the king of France, um, Louis, um, build up his own army, but he also builds this big, huge palace that we'll look at on the next slide. It's called the Palace at Versailles. And this is a huge palace, and he forces his nobility to live in his palace with him. The, the thinking here is that if I can live with my nobility, I can keep an eye on them. I can spy on them more easily. Um, and so I can find out if they have any plots to overthrow me or plots to rebel, right? Keep your friends close, but your enemies closer kind of thing. Um, in addition to that, here at court at Versailles, at this huge palace, I'm going to live... Uh, like like a rock star, right? I am going to have the latest clothes, the most expensive fashion, um, the best chefs, right? And for the nobility who are at this court, they don't want to look like they're poor, and so they're going to spend as well on clothes and um, dinner parties and chefs and jewelry, right? Just to show everybody else in France and the king that we're not some paupers, that we belong, that we're high society too, and of course, this is genius by the king, because all of these nobility living at court, spending lavishly to keep up with their fellow nobles and the king, they're going to be spending all of their money on finery and not on armies for themselves, not on building up their own power base. They're going to be squandering their money. And so the king is able to keep an eye on his noble enemies at court, and he also is able to keep them just spending money on frivolity and not real um, you know, like the, their own armies. So genius plan by King Louis. And so here's an example. This is all from the palace at Versailles. Um, in the bottom right-hand picture, you see um, the king's bedroom, and you can imagine this huge uh, ornate bedroom with all of this gold and silver and jewelry and, and everything else and finery. And if you are a noble living at court, you're like, well, I have to spend on my own rooms too. And so you're spending money on that instead of your own army. Um, here we see the Hall of Mirrors in, in Palace of Versailles. Again, just overwhelming people with your power. And this is kind of another thing here is that the King Louis will use artwork and public works projects to show everybody just how rich and powerful he is. Not only does that get his nobility to try to copy him and spend their money in frivolous ways, but also it's used as a way of intimidation, right? Art and architecture can be used to intimidate people that, wow, if he can afford this amazing palace up here, um, he could kill me, no problem. And so these big gardens and this big palace here, um, and we'll see that he paints paintings to make himself look like a king or, or even a god, right? Um, that they will just intimidate people into believing that he really does have divine right and I should do what he says.
All right, so then the third and final example we have for absolute monarchs, we're going to go all the way across Europe to Eastern Europe, and we're going to use Russia as an example. And so if you remember, at the end of period one, at the beginning of period two, Russia is just starting to emerge as a kingdom. In the past, they were divided under a bunch of little tiny principalities, like the Holy Roman Empire, um, and each king kind of, or prince kind of controlled their own affairs. Um, but then the Mongols came in in period one, and they put the Prince of Moscow in charge of collecting tribute, and eventually he uses that to kind of gain power and money and influence, and then he eventually overthrows the Mongols, and he kind of starts to centralize Russia under his own control. And this was Ivan III leading a rebellion against the Mongols um, and starting the process of centralizing Europe, going, or centralizing Russia, going from many disparate, um, separate uh, principalities to now increasingly will be under the control of one prince, one king, the Prince of Moscow. Now he also uses history um, to gain legitimacy. And so when Ivan III says, I'm going to be the new ruler of Russia, well, okay, he has the biggest army and he has the most money, um, but still, why should I do what he says? And so he has his son marry the daughter of the Byzantine Empire. Um, and the Byzantine Empire is really just a continuation of the old Roman Empire. And so those families have been ruling for a long, 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 long time. And so now the uh, Russian ruler can say that my family by marriage and future children is tied in all the way back to the Roman Empire. And so our family are rulers that are born to be rulers going back far, far, far. And so he takes the name Caesar um, for his family, because Caesar is what the title of the Roman Empire is going back a thousand years, and so that gains him legitimacy, right? People have heard of the ancient Roman Empire and the might of the Caesars, and so now we start to think of him as a mighty Caesar as well, right? It's power by association. And so, of course, in Russian, Caesar is Tsar, and so the Russian kings start to take this title for themselves. Now, let's talk about Russian expansion. And so now as the Prince of Moscow becomes the king of Russia, um, he's looking for ways to ex continue to expand his power. Now, Russia does not expand by sea. We've talked about that before. Um, even though they have all this coast up here, um, it's frozen, right? And so here's where the Russia starts. Here's the Prince of Moscow. And by consolidating his power, we can see on the key, he's able to add more and more and more power. And for the most part, his power goes east, not west. Um, he can't go west because absolute monarchs are rising in Western Europe, and so they're too strong to challenge him for power, and so he has to go east, right? So what he does is he creates his own standing army, a permanent army, because that seems to be what we do to be an absolute monarch now. And so he uses his own private army, and they're professionals, right? They do nothing but train all day how to be better soldiers, mm -hmm. and he adopts gunpowder weapons, um, which his nobles don't have, and so he's able to exert his authority over them. And then with this professional army, um, with gunpowder weapons, he starts his march east. Now it says a conscript army, and so what he does is he drafts his peasants into the army. Now they have to serve for at least 20 years, and so that means that they're going to be professional soldiers, and um, they're going to be with him for a long, long time, and they're going to be good at what they do. And so this army is going to move east further and further and further, and they're using cannons, like I said, gunpowder army. Now, to, to, to another way to centralize and to get the nobles on his side, instead of fighting against him, they're fighting with him, we're going to see Ivan III and future, future czars say to the nobility, if you help me out and go get land further east, I will give you a portion of that land. And of course, the nobles equate land to wealth, and so they're going to be loyal to him. As long as he continues to expand and gain power and hand out this land, then I'm going to get richer and richer and richer. And so again, we see it's a symbiotic relationship that the czar gets the noble support because he's going to hand out land to them. And so they're going to give him an army and they're going to give him their political support um, as he continues to move further and further east. So the nobles get more land as they move east and the czar gets more land and power as he moves east. Right Now, um, uh, so what we see here um, is as we move further east, well, most of the population of Russia is over here. And over in the east is these big, huge, it's this thing called the taiga forest. And up here is called Siberia, where it's too cold to really grow anything. And so as the Russians move east, 
they they're getting land, but they don't. There's not any peasants over here to actually make the land worthwhile to chop down the trees, to go get furs, to uh, plant crops. And so, not only does the Russian czar and the nobility conscript peasant armies, um, but they also conscript peasants and re forcefully resettle them on farmland to the east. And so, we see that this is a very top-down approach. And so, we're forcefully migrating peasants to the east as we add more land. All right. Um, next, um, uh, we also see that as the Russians move east, they're going to enter some Muslim, Muslim areas. This is a crescent moon, symbol for Islam. And so this is a heavy Muslim area. And so the Russians don't force the um, Muslims to convert because um, that would cause a big out, fallout religious war. And they don't want to do that. They just want to conquer, administer, and then keep conquering, not have to conquer um, and fight a religious war. And so they can't conquer anymore. And so we see that these people are allowed to stay Muslim. And so we hear, see we another example of a government treatment of religious minorities. They're going to allow the Muslims to stay in their religion as long as they pay their taxes and don't cause problems, not forced to convert. All right. Oh, one final thing. As we've talked about this before, but we see as the Russians move east, there are some people that are living here. Right, that you might kind of think of them as Eskimos, these native people, and they live in the in the forest, and so the Russians will trade with them and sometimes force them to collect furs in return for trade goods. And so this is very similar to the French as we have talked about in the New World. So just a little review there. All right. So let's talk about more absolute monarchy. And so Ivan the Fourth wants to continue his father Ivan the Third's centralization policy, and so what he does is he starts to adopt some things that help them centralize, and so he creates a secret police. These are people that are loyal to Ivan the Fourth, um, that want him to gain more power, and they live among the nobility and among the peasants, and they're secret, so you don't know if they're reporting back to Ivan or not. And so, if you're a peasant or if you're a noble, if you even whisper something disloyal to the to the emperor, to the Russian emperor, the czar, um, that might get reported back to the emperor and he will, right, knock on your door and he will arrest you and kill you. And so um, this is a way of ruling through fear that everybody just keeps their mouth shut because they don't know who they're talking to, could be their friend, could be their brother, could be their daughter, who knows, right? These are secret police that might get back to the emperor, the czar, um, and he might kill you. So everybody just toes the line and keeps their mouth shut. And so this allows the uh, czar to centralize, right? He also raises money through tax farming. Now, all of the absolute monarchs did this, but I just decided to talk about it here. So tax farming is a new way of tax collection. It's a form of direct taxation in, in a way, right? It's a form of collecting taxes without having to, develop, to depend on the feudal pyramid because that makes kings weak if they have to depend on nobility. And so tax farming is this, right? So what I do is I say, uh, I have a province. Let's just call it province A, right? And um, normally in the past, I've had to depend on the nobility to go and collect those taxes from province A and then give me some of those taxes. But that made me depend on the nobility. I don't like it. I want to centralize, right? And so what I do is I say, I'm going to take away the ability of the, the way of the power of the nobility to collect taxes in province A, and I'm going to sell it, right? So who wants to collect taxes? It used to be the noble's job to collect taxes, but I don't want to depend on them anymore. And so who wants this? And so people start bidding for the power and the right, the legal right to collect taxes in province A. And so let's say that the going rate, I'm just making this number up, is a million dollars, all right? And so um, it could be a merchant, it could be a noble, it could be um, just anybody really who has the money. They pay up front and they give the Russian czar a million dollars to collect all the taxes from province A. Now, the czar loves this because he's got his money right now. He doesn't have to wait for it to be collected from all the peasants. He just has it now up front. And so the czar is happy and he goes and he conquers and he builds up a standing army with the money and that's great. Right? And now the person who bought the right to collect the taxes, they overtax that province. Right? Um, they, they collect enough to pay off the, um, their debt that they've went into um, you know, pay to collect taxes, but then they start charging the peasants and the nobility in the area even more to make a profit off of this. And so it's ruinous to the people in province A, but what does the czar care? He got his money right off the bat up front. Right? And so this process is called tax farming. It allows monarchs to centralize. 
price because they get their money right away. And then, um, you know, so then they're off to go, you know, run their army or whatever. But also in the kind of an unintended consequence is it really starts to hurt uh, the peasants and it hurts, starts to hurt the nobility because we're going to collect even more taxes than the Tsar ever did because whoever bought the right to be a tax farmer um, is going to overcharge. And so this is a new way of collecting taxes. All right. So now let's kind of go away from the political for a bit. So we gave you three examples of absolute monarchs that are going to try to continue to um, increase and centralize their power. And now let's talk about social changes that are going on through Europe. Um, and so one of the things we see is something called the putting out system or cottage industry. And so let's do a change over time here. And so as, uh, in, if you remember in the past, um, Production was done either by serfs on the manor um, or by artisans in a guild somewhere. Um, and the guilds did not want to, they, they controlled production. And so as Europe's population is increasing in period two, because of the Columbian exchange and more food products coming in from the new world, right, you see there's a demand for more clothes, there's a demand for more goods. Um, and so the, normally the guilds would make that, right? The guilds were the artisans that made shoes and hats and clothes and spoons and whatever, right? But the guilds do not want to increase production um, because that would lower the prices, right? The more you have of anything, the price goes down. And so the guilds like goods to be high quality but also scarce because that drives up prices. But the people still need clothes, right? They still need shoes, and even more now than ever before. And so we have to find a new way of making goods that goes around the guilds. And so some merchants start to realize, wait a minute, I think there's a way of making money here. And so we call these people merchant capitalists. Merchant capitalists are people who are traditionally merchants, but they're going to try to get involved in the production of goods, not just the transportation of goods. Merchants are transport goods, capitalists make goods, and so they're trying to blend the two. And so what they do is the merchant goes and buys a whole bunch of wool or cotton or whatever raw material you can think of. And instead of taking them to the guilds to make, what they do is they take them out into the countryside because the guilds are in the cities, right? And if they took them to the cities, the guild would say, we are not making this. We have a stranglehold on production in the city, so no. And so what they do is they take these raw materials to the countryside and they usually give them to these women. Now, maybe they're women that are looking for a way to make a buck because they're young and single and they don't have a husband to help provide for them. Or maybe they're widows whose husbands have died and so they don't have a husband to provide for them. And so we see this woman workforce out in the countryside and the merchant capitalist says, look, I just bought all of this raw material. Let's use wool as an example. And I want you to turn it into clothing, right, in your cottage. Um, do it in your house. And I'm going to come back. And in a couple of months, I want you to have made, you know, 10 sweaters, right? Um, and so the merchant will say, okay, I'll come back. And so then in, in a month or two, they come back and these women have turned the wool into a sweater, into clothing, or into shoes, or into pick your good here, right? Put your good here. And so we see that it's called the putting out system because the women actually physically put out the goods from their cottages for the merchants to pick up. Then the merchants will pay the women, so that's good for the women, and then they'll give them more wool for the next time around. And so this is a way of increasing production to meet the demand but going around the guilds and going into the countryside to do it. It's also called the cottage industry because these goods are actually being made in cottages themselves. And so we have a change, a new production system here in Europe developing. All right, so the merchant class is now rising in wealth for two reasons. One, they're engaged in this putting out system, kind of financing that, but they're also engaged in carrying goods back and forth across the Atlantic, back to the Indian Ocean and back, to the Pacific, the Manila Galleons and back. And so with all of this increased world trade that we talked about in the first lecture with exploration and colonization, that the merchants are rising and rising in wealth and power. And so we see, um, sorry, in wealth. And so we see this merchant family in the Netherlands, because remember the Dutch are a strong merchant um, power at this point, and they become wealthy, their clothes are wealthy, they've got servants, as you can see. Um, and so they're rising in, um, in wealth. But the problem is, 
they're not rising in social status. Um, they have all the wealth you can have in the world, um, but they are looked down upon by kings and nobles, and they just don't like this. I have, in some cases, more money than most of the nobles as a merchant, so why am I looked down upon? And so they're going to find two ways to kind of get in, uh, get, raise their social status. One is to just flat out buy titles from nobility. If you have a noble who has kind of fallen on hard times, they might be land rich, but they're cash poor, they can't afford to pay their servants anymore, they can't pay the fair, afford to pay their taxes, remember taxes are going up with direct taxation and tax farming, and so they risk going to jail and losing everything. And so here comes a rich merchant and says, look, I will give you all the money you need to get out of debt so you don't go to jail, but I'm going to buy your title from you. And so the merchant now has a title. He has reached the higher level of social status. Um, and, the, and the noble is no longer a noble. He sold his title, but at least he's not going to jail. right? At least he can feed his family now. There's a second way that merchants rose into power besides buying titles. Sometimes they just married into it. And so let's say the noble has a son, but he's poor, right? But he still has the title. He's the duke of such and such, right? And the merchant has a daughter, um, and he's rich, but he has no title. Um, and so the families join together through this marriage, and now the noble family has an infusion of cash, um, and so they're able to keep their title and their lands, and the merchant family now has some respectability because they are now part of this long um, tradition of nobility in Europe. And so, they, so we see the merchant class really is this new rising class in Europe that is gaining economic power and also now um, social and political power as well. All right. Now, the final thing we have here changing in Europe is we have something called the scientific revolution. As we Europe is discovering new worlds all around the world, right? They're discovering new hemispheres, new people, new plants, new animals, new cultures, um, discovering new knowledge from the Muslim world and from India and from China, right? We start to question the church. In the past, the church said everything you need to know comes from God and the Bible. Don't question. But now we see that there are other sources of knowledge out there than the church. Um, and we're learning about new things every day. And if the church is wrong about one thing, maybe they're wrong about everything. And so we see Europeans have this quest for new learning, new knowledge. They learn about math from the Islamic world through Mediterranean trade and Indian Ocean trade. Um, they learn about um, compasses from China and, and the Indian Ocean trade and from Muslims. And so they're starting to think about um, logic and reasoning and science, and they're reconnecting with their Greco-Roman past, where people started to use, had used science and logic and reasoning way back in classical Europe. And so Europeans are increasingly looking to find things out for themselves and not take the church's word for it. And so they use observation. Let me figure out why this is happening. If I see um, uh, lightning in the sky, then I think, well, maybe there's a reason for that besides what the church says, or a rainbow, or drought, or an earthquake. You get the idea. And I'm going to use math because we've been introduced to math from the Muslim world, right? And I'm going to use science as well from the Muslim world. All of these things leads to what is called the scientific revolution. And so we start studying the skies again. We start looking at prisms and how light refracts, um, dissecting the human body. All of these things have previously been frowned on by the Catholic Church, but now we have these new men called scientists that are using science and logic and reasoning to figure things out. And increasingly, Europe is much more literate, so they can pass this knowledge on to a greater, wider range of people. And so the pace of knowledge starts to pick up as people build on each other's um, ideas because merchants are literate, right? They have to be literate to read their trade lists and manifests and their bills and their receipts and their exchanges. And so we see a much wider audience of people being literate that are open to learning about these new ideas. Um, and so we see um, also the printing press is enveloped, developed in Europe at this time. So ideas can spread quicker and faster and be built upon. And so the pace of technology starts to pick up in Europe as well as science. And so that's how Europe is going through these religious, economic, political, cultural changes at this time. And that ends our notes.